I want to share something with you this morning, and, I, and what I want to share was fairly brief anyway, so <clears throat> that's probably providential. Yes, sure. We've been talking about better things. Now the Jews understood baptisms. Remember, the Jews went out to, to see John the Baptist baptizing. And that they would be baptized as a, as a recognition that I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to be cleansed. They understood that. But Jesus came to bring better things. Not a choice between good and bad, but a choice between good and better. And so I want to read two of these scriptures, and then there's another scripture at the end that I think are very important this morning, and mostly I'm going to let God's Word speak to us. Would you stand with me, and let's read together Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, and then we'll do the one in Acts. Matthew chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, far outside the city, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat or food was locusts and wild honey. How many of you kids like to eat bugs? Any of you kids like to eat bugs? Okay, well, John ate bugs all the time. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins, confessing, saying, I've done wrong things. I know that I am not clean. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, these are, these are the religious leaders, come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you? to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth, therefore, fruits or things, meat or suitable for repentance, things that show that God has actually done this for you and that that's what you want him to do. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father or as our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Recognize it, we've done this before uh, fairly recently. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down or cut down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor or his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the garner or barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable yes. fire. Yes. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll speak your words into our hearts. In these moments, help us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt who you are and your plan for us. We ask it through the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Move with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. After Jesus' ministry on earth. Now, the first scripture was the very beginning because the very next verse says, And Jesus came to be baptized by John the Baptist. This is after Jesus' earthly ministry. This is after he's died on the cross for our sins. This is after the resurrection. He had said, there's more. There's more coming. Chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost, remember, just a festival, just a... Jewish festival, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They're just having fellowship, having a party. 
And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven or divided tongues like as of fire, and eat sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This morning, I want you to understand that this baptism, this water baptism, this baptism of repentance that says, I am forgiven of my sins, is the beginning of an amazing relationship with God. But He wants you to go deeper. He wants you to go on beyond that. Beyond simply saying, my sin is forgiven, to saying, I am consumed. By the Holy Spirit, by the Almighty God. He has come in and baptized me with fire. Now, that's a little difficult concept to understand, being baptized with fire. All right? But I had the opportunity once to go to a steel mill in, in uh, West Virginia. And I was amazed to see the kilns down below, and they're very, very hot. They're lined with bricks and things that, that keep them, that make them able to withstand the heat. They're about 18 feet long to high, probably about 15 or so feet around the top. On the level that I was at, we were just above them, and they were taking the forklift they were putting the forklift under the pallets. They were moving it over here, and they were dropping it into the, into the hot molten, that means the, the metal, which is really hard when it's cold. When it's really hot, it was liquid. It was that hot. He just dumped it in, pallets and all, bags and all. Everything went in. So how can you do that? Doesn't that mess up? mess up the type of metal because they have to put certain things in to make the metal work for certain purposes. He said, no. It is so hot that all of the impurities are cooked away. The fire takes care of all the impurities. Uh, yes. Yeah. That's right. God himself is the one that said he would be like a refiner's fire who takes metal that is rock hard, melts it, and gets out the impurities, the things that shouldn't be there, the things that keep it from being pure. God Almighty wants to refine yes. us. He Amen. wants to baptize us with fire to go on and say, I want to be consumed by all that God is, so that all that people see in me is Jesus reflected. I want to become so pure that I can reflect the character of Jesus himself. That's what God wants to do to us. It's what he wants to do for all of us. It goes beyond water baptism. It goes past repentance, which is turning around and going in another direction. It is a baptism by the Holy Spirit where God transforms us. Adam Clark said, it, said this, Outward precepts or rules, however well they might describe or describe what we're supposed to do, could not produce inward spirituality. Catch that. The list of rules, no matter how great, no matter how wonderfully laid out, cannot Amen. produce inward right. spirituality. As a church, as a denomination, we've gone through some time when we thought maybe that was possible. But we realize that it is only the Holy Spirit's working in us that makes it possible at all. It is not our stuff. It is not our job. It is not our doing. Our will that makes it happen. It is God himself. Here are some words that are used that I, that I think are, are good words for you to, to have to, to write down on your, uh, your bulletin there. 
This baptism by fire illuminates the soul, it invigorates the soul, it penetrates every part of who we are, and it assimilates the whole of who we are to become like Christ. Get these words? Illuminates, invigorates, penetrates, and assimilates. The Holy Spirit is searching. He knows who we are. And He does the work to keep going through us to find out what's not supposed to be there. And what He takes care of 10 years ago is going to be different than what He takes care of 10 years from now. Because as God refines us, the impurities keep coming to the top to be burned off. He is searching. He is consuming. Yes. He is refining. And I came across this word, and I had to look it up, sublimating. Now, I've heard the word before, but I found the definition fascinating. <clears throat> what is sublimating? Well, in, in chemistry, remember, God's the creator, so even chemistry works. There's another definition you'll see in a moment, but... In chemistry, it means to cause something like a solid or a gas to change the state, to become different than that without becoming a liquid. Remember I said metal is solid? You melt it, it becomes a liquid. Then you can form it into something else solid, right? So you change the solid into a liquid. But sublimating is skipping that part of the process, going from one state to the other without having to go through this liquid state. How does that connect with us and what God wants to do? How about this definition, the rest of it? To modify the natural expression of a primitive, instinctual impulse in a socially acceptable manner. Our natural tendency, our instinctual, the instinct, the way that we respond is changed. That's what God wants to do. He wants to change us. He wants to change us from the inside out. So why submit to this kind of searching and consuming, refining, sublimating act that can be painful at times? Because God wants to make us something new. And he gave us an example. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. We spent a lot of time in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to read the the whole chapter. So please follow along. Hebrews chapter 12. He's gone through, this is why Jesus Christ is, is better, deeper than, than the, the rules and things that you followed before, the ceremonies that you followed before. Because he's this high priest that understands who we are, understands what we've gone through. We've been talking about those things, better things. Then he goes through and says, these people had faith in the Almighty, this amazing faith that they wanted to see the days that we live in. They wanted to see Jesus come. They wanted to see God writing his law on the hearts of mankind. And we didn't have to go through the rituals to have our sins forgiven. Then he says, wherefore, Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, those who've gone on before, those who've lived this before, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience or perseverance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author, and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You haven't given your blood for this yet. 
and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, or disciplines, and scourgeth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he endure chastening or discipline, God dealeth with you as with sons, his own children. For what son is, is he whom the father chasteneth not, or does not discipline? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye illegitimate bastards and not sons. He's not your father. Furthermore, we have had fathers to our flesh, or of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence or honor. Shall we not much rather be in subjection or submission unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened or disciplined us after their own pleasure. But he, God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening or infliction of pain for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised or trained thereby. I know Jesse and Clayton and several of you others do training in different kinds of things. You have games on Saturday. Why not just go to the game on Saturday? You have to get better. You need practice. You have to train. That's what God wants to do with us. He wants to train us. And sometimes he says, that's not good enough or that needs to be different. But he says it in here so that we understand it's for us. Twelve. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Because sometimes we get discouraged trying to be like God. Trying to let him do his work in us. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that, that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat or food sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched. We're talking about the mountain where Moses was. And that burned with fire, nor unto blackness, and darkness, and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words which voice they had heard. They that heard entreated or requested that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Remember we talked about that. God spoke to the people directly and the people said we don't want to hear from you directly God. Talk to Moses and we'll decide if we're going to listen to him or not. For they could not endure that which was commanded and if so much as a beast touched the mountain it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart and so terrible was the sight that Moses said I exceedingly fear and quake but Ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the, he the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable, unnumberable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven through his salvation, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifying the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Yes, Amen. yes he is. That's a huge passage I realize. 
But you have to catch the whole story. You have to catch the whole thought. Jesus Christ was the example of what it means not just to be forgiven of sins, not just to be baptized and then well on your way, but to be inhabited, to be filled with the Holy Spirit yes. that writes God's law on our hearts and allows us the ability to actually live the way that God calls us to yes. live. Not just saying, here's the rules, we can't possibly follow them, but instead saying, God has placed in my heart the knowledge of what's right and wrong and the ability, the strength to live it. And it keeps consuming us. Yes. What is impure, what isn't of Him. On and on and on. To be baptized with fire is to move deeper with a holy God. A holy God, a separate God, a completely other God that calls us to be separated for His honor and for His glory. He is a consuming fire and He wants to consume us so that we might be purified. We spoke a few days ago about mirrors that it came up with something that we were talking about. We talked about uh, ladies having mirrors that were made of metal when they came out of, when they came out of Egypt. Um, they brought all of their metal things and all of the jewels and so that they could be used to, to make the tabernacle, the things of the tabernacle. And they melted their mirrors and the comment was made, I'm glad I didn't live back then, that the only mirror I had was this, this metal. But think about how shiny and how reflective pure gold or pure silver looks. God wants to get rid of all of the excess stuff, all of the things that don't belong there in us. Yes. And he wants to baptize us with his Holy Spirit because he wants us to make a difference in our world. He wants us to live like him in a world that doesn't. Can I get my kids to help me? I've got a couple things here. If I've got a couple kids that will help, I would appreciate it. Charlie, if you'll go over on that side of the room and give each person one of those. Mm -hmm. On that side. And if you'll go on this side and give people on this side of the aisle one. Every person needs one. God calls us to be salt and light in the world. In order for us to be that, we have to have this consuming fire to purify us. And this is an ongoing task. This is something that he keeps doing because, it, like I said, it keeps bubbling to the surface, the humanity of who we are. But God wants to do an amazing work through his people. He wants society to be transformed by his people. He wants us to live in such a way that everybody sees him reflected in us. There are a couple people in the very back. If you'll, uh, if you'll give them, I appreciate it. So I'm asking you to take this. Now I realize in nine days, we're going to elect a new president. We're also going to elect senators, <coughs> representatives, governors, mayors, local councils, school boards, police chiefs. We have an opportunity in America that not many countries have, and that is to actually cast a vote, cast a ballot. But I'm here to tell you that unless we're where we should be first, we can't be effective in doing that. Because we have to be led by the Holy Spirit. So, this prayer chart for you for the next few days is to remind you of this scripture from 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So the first few days, 
are about getting us individually where we need to be with God. And then to pray for those who lead, for those who are preparing to lead, for those who are already leading, for those who will be leading in all of these different areas. Praying that God will have His way. See, Christians aren't supposed to be outside looking in. Even our forefathers expected that as Christians, men and women who have morals would make decisions based on the leading from a holy God. And so I encourage you, invest time in prayer. Thinking about this, Lord, consume me of all that I am. Because we can get really bent out of shape when we talk about politics, when we talk about religion, when we talk about a lot of things. There are a number of things that really kind of bend us out of shape. But what God wants is people that are humble and will submit to His plan and choose to follow Him in obedience. That's what I think God is calling us.